All right, I'd like to um, open the uh, public session. We'll just, just ask that uh, you step up to the microphone, state your name and address, and keep your comments to uh, under five minutes if possible. I have one person signed up to speak, and that's Kimberly Rebior. Thank you for your time. I'm Kimberly, and I lived right next to the house that was burnt down. I had two fire hydrants nearby in my vicinity that did not work. I was understanding that you had hired someone for the DPW that was willing to take care of this situation. The bare minimum of these firemen that you all decided would be safe for an old city of Oswego, New York, I'm sorry to tell you that you're going to have another fire worse than this because we cannot handle it that way. I seen a lot. I was at work that day, but my children seen a lot. I had pictures that proved the time delay because of these fire hydrants were over 40 minutes. They were spraying inside, I heard from a fireman, but that wasn't good enough. Your zoning let you down. Your zoning cited me for a soup on my, neck, my roof. We put a new one in. The firefighters had to put a hole in it. That was fine. My back structure lived through it. The upper structure did not through the water damage. I was told on a Sunday by three firemen that were trying to put out the fire that I needed to go to the police department to get a, uh, someone to take me into my home. I went there. They kind of snickered. They were very polite. And they said, we don't do that. But you could go at your own risk. I did not try to fool them. There was a sticker on, uh, do not enter on the, the building. My structure in the back was perfect. I had a little damage in just going up my stairway. Everything, the bedrooms, everything was great. A little smoke damage could have been cleaned up. However, zoning, Kirk from zoning came in at 3 o'clock. This was 10 when I went to the police and went in there and took a few things. By 3.30, Kirk come flying by with his big truck and told us we had to leave. It was unsafe. I, he says, I'm calling the police. I says, go ahead. The police gave me under your own risk. He went there. He got an officer named Williams. Williams came a few minutes later, did a UE around, and came back and said we had to leave. Well, we left. The kids in the neighborhood aren't very nice. They broke into my home. They stole many things. And by, by nine, 8 o'clock in the morning, zoning had said our structure was safe. None of this was appropriate, prepared, and even organized. No one knew what the other one was doing. This administration cannot let our firemen go. We need at least 10 minimum to keep our city safe on a shift. Seven won't do it. Your partnership deal that you're talking about. Is it fair to them that we might have some, our ambulance treating a, someone with a heart attack and we can only send three to a brush fire or a barn fire, which is coming up with this drier weather? It's not going to work, sir. It's not going to work. And people here, they're older than you, and I'm sure they understood and lived through the big fire 20 years ago. And then we had 12 at minimum. What's going to happen now? I am seeking a lawyer, and I'm going to do the best I can for Oswego because it's obvious that you people that we elected think more about a pay-to-play system than your constituents. Thank you very much. And uh, would anyone else in the audience like to speak? Seeing none, I'll close public session. Regular meeting starts at 7.30. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Will you uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Clerk, please call the roll. 
His Honor the Mayor. Here. Councillor Reynolds. Here. Councillor McLaughlin. Here. Councillor Emmons. Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Councillor Gosick. Here. Councillor Van Buren. Here. Councillor Cordino. Here. All present. Thank you. Uh, under the Mayor's report, we have the uh, final presentation uh, by Bergman Associates and Kimberly Baptiste here, uh, who will give us the, the final update on our Complete Streets project. Thank you very much for having us back. It was probably about six months ago that we were last here presenting about an interim update of where things stood with the Complete Streets project. So we're happy to be back to give you an update on where we landed with regards to recommendations. Joining me tonight are two of my colleagues, Ted Liddell and Andy Rouse. Um, and we're just going to take you through a quick update. Excuse some of the slides and the um, technical transition, some of the formatting got a little bit mixed up, but um, quick introduction of the project team. Obviously, we worked very closely with the Department of Community and Economic Development here at the city. In addition to Bergman Associates, our project team included Alta Planning and Design, a firm out of Troy, New York, and Arterial, a firm out of New Jersey that specializes in complete streets. Won't be able to read all of these members, but our project advisory committee was a very active, helpful group that really um, assisted us in guiding the project process, assisted us with regards to community outreach and engagement, and gave us a lot of great feedback over the course of about six to eight meetings over the last year. And we're very thankful for all of the time and commitment that those members put forward to move this project. The funding for this project, as a reminder, came through NYSERDA, through the Cleaner Greener Communities Grant Program. And what is a complete street? So a quick, a quick primer um, about the premise of the project. So a complete street is really just a term that um, shows that as a community, you're focused on developing corridors and roadways that are safe not only for vehicular and truck transportation, but for all modes of transportation. Um, whether it's pedestrians, bicyclists, you know, strollers, folks in wheelchairs that maybe aren't as able-bodied moving around. So it's really making sure that um, the city of Oswego, and particularly the 104 corridor, is a welcoming environment for all, all users. The project limits for um, the Complete Streets project, as you might recall, is Route 104 in its entirety from the western city limit all the way through to the eastern city limit. So it includes the entire 104 corridor. And our overall um, purpose and objectives for the project was really to study the corridor, understand what some of the existing deficiencies were as they exist today, identify new opportunities for projects and improvements, and then most importantly, identify funding sources and how does the city move forward with implementing the Complete Streets project. Difficult to read, but essentially a recap of the project process. So this project kicked off just about a year ago um, in the spring of 2016. And over the course of that year, we've done, you know, developed the plan as well as a significant amount of community engagement, which I'll quickly recap now before handing it over to Ted. Um, we had two designated public open houses. One was held in May of last year, which was our visioning open house, so getting initial ideas and feedback from the community on what they saw as issues and opportunities. And then in October of 2016, again, we had a open house for the public where they had the opportunity to vote on various alternatives and um, share their feedback on preferences for the corridor. In addition, we also spent a day at SUNY Oswego to make sure we were getting feedback and input from students to better understand how they travel and would like to travel the 104 corridor. And we did some really fun experiential engagement as well. We did a bus tour back in May of 2016 where we got filled up a Centro bus with folks, residents, and as folks were getting off, you know, we handed them walkers, we handed them strollers, sat them in a wheelchair, and asked them to experience the corridor not from a vehicular perspective as they normally travel, but to really understand what the characteristics of the corridor are. If you are um, elderly, if you need assistance walking, 
And it was really quite eye-opening and enlightening to see the difference in how the corridor is experienced from the perspective of a vehicle as opposed to a pedestrian. In November of 2016, we also did a tactical urbanism demonstration. And essentially what this is, is taking boxes, balloons, different everyday materials, and creating some of the improvements that are being recommended through this plan. So you can see those changes and how they might um, relate to streetscape improvements. We also have a project website um, that's as well as a Facebook page and have gotten a lot of feedback and insights from both of those online forums as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ted to talk about some of the design aspects. All right, so to give you a, a recap of the, of the project, uh, one of the first things that we did was take a look at the existing conditions along the Route 104 corridor, as Kimberly said, which goes uh, through the entire city from the western to uh, eastern city limits. Um, we took the corridor and we broke it up into um, six distinct character areas so that it would be easier to take a look at um, and to inventory the existing conditions. Um, the existing or the character areas were based on um, existing land uses, if there was residential on the street or if it was commercial. Um, and so we broke it up into those pieces so that we could take an in-depth look at, at the existing conditions and see what the corridor had to offer. Uh, one of the, the things that we looked at uh, in all six character areas are we looked at the roadway network. So we looked at um, lane widths, we looked at um, traffic counts, accident reports um, to get a good idea of what's happening on the corridor today. Um, we also looked at uh, signal timing, um, the existence of crosswalks, uh, the location of on-street parking and any regulations that um, any parking regulations that there may be. We also looked at the pedestrian network. So through the entire corridor, we inventoried um, the existing sidewalks. We took a look at um, the width of the sidewalks, the condition. Um, we noted where there were uh, sidewalks missing and also areas of sidewalk that may not be um, ADA compliant. So somebody in a wheelchair or somebody with a stroller might not be able to, to use that portion of the sidewalk. We also took a look at um, existing bike networks in the city, um, existing trails, and also um, uh, bike routes that are um, used by uh, community members that we heard about through some of our, our public engagement. We also looked at the Centro bus system uh, along the corridor. We noted where there were bus stops, where the routes were coming from, and where they were going to. Um, and so to determine who was using the corridor um, and how the corridor could be improved for people that um, are also using the bus system. So after all of this information was gathered about a year ago, um, a group of planners, landscape architects, and traffic engineers. We all sat in a room. We took all of this information and we thought about how can we take what we now know about the Route 104 corridor in, Os corridor in Oswego and how can we make it safe for not only vehicles but as Kimberly said for pedestrians and for, for bicyclists. So we looked at a few key areas um, along the corridor and came up with some design alternatives one of these areas was an area we call the Western Gateway, uh, which is the western, from basically the western city uh, limit to the um, 104 Washington Boulevard, um, Seneca Street intersection um, over by McDonald's. Um, today, this, um, this section of the corridor is a uh, two-lane road in each direction, and there's a, a depressed median in the center. Um, some of the alternatives that we looked at were taking that median and planting it uh, to make it a rain garden facility to capture stormwater runoff. Um, we also looked at the addition of a bike lane, uh, so that a dedicated bike lane, so that bicyclists coming from SUNY Oswego could go down um, the Route 104 corridor uh, into downtown. 
And we also looked at the potential for a reduction of the number of lanes on Route 104. Um, some of the preliminary numbers that we had said that, that we could reduce down to one lane in each direction, uh, creating less pavement, and also giving us the opportunity to create um, or to add uh, sidewalks, wider sidewalks, at least five feet um, in width, um, new lighting area for street trees, pedestrian lighting, creating it a more welcoming environment for pedestrians, but also creating um, a central gateway into the, into the city. One of the other uh, major areas that we looked at was the uh, six-point intersection that's at the um, intersection of 104 Washington Boulevard, Seneca Street. Um, through our community engagement, we heard a lot of people say that it was very difficult to cross this intersection and to also to navigate it in your car. It can be, it can be confusing. So our, our group of designers sat down and brainstormed and came up with about six or seven different alternatives for this intersection. Some of them were simple paint changes, you know, restriping crosswalks in a different alignment. And some were more complicated, like the introduction of a roundabout um, or even a double roundabout to help with the circulation. Um, we looked at all possibilities from small to really out of the box sort of thinking. Now, throughout the corridor, our initial uh, concept was that we wanted to make the 104 corridor itself um, safe for, again, pedestrians, vehicles, and bicyclists. So our initial concepts included a bike lane on Route 104. Um, this uh, caused us to have to um, make room on the road uh, for the bike lane. We weren't looking to change the road width. We were staying within the curb to curb that's existing today. So um, with the traffic numbers that we, that we had, we saw that we could reduce the number of lanes in each direction by doing um, one travel lane in each direction, going from two travel lanes in each direction to one in each direction with a center turn lane. This would allow us to um, have a five foot dedicated bike lane on the north and south side of the road. One of the things though that um, this concept uh, also did though is it removed parking on one side of Route 104, which I'll get into that when we talk about the preferred alternatives. Um, we also looked at pedestrian improvements. Again, there was a, I mentioned there was a couple of areas where the sidewalks, where they were either non-existent or there were um, stairs located in the sidewalk so that people in a wheelchair would be able to use them. Um, this was one area between East uh, 10th Street and East 13th Street. Um, where we came up with alternatives that would provide a safe route for people to be able to uh, walk from downtown to the, the major retail area to the east where all the big box retail stores are. So after we came up with all of these recommendations, we brought them back to the committee and we also brought them back to the public to get the input um, of, on the designs and to hear if anybody else had any other ideas or um, if there were things that people liked or disliked. One of the, um, one of the major things that we heard was that uh, people thought that having a bike lane on Route 104 was a good idea, but they also thought they wouldn't use it. They still felt that they would feel unsafe. Um, so one of the ideas was to take the bike lanes off of Route 104 and look for alternative routes to the north and the south of the corridor. So what that did is it, it helped create some more opportunities um, for some other improvements, which I'll show you in a couple other slides. But on the, the Western Gateway, um, the preferred alternative ended up being kind of a, a blend of the alternatives that we came up with. Um, we didn't reduce the number of lanes that was uh, an issue that was brought up by the, by the community that they felt it was very important to keep uh, the two lanes in each direction in order to have um, good traffic flow. But we were still able to incorporate um, five foot sidewalks on each side with pedestrian lighting um, and also the incorporation of a raised median in the center of the road to uh, have an area for plantings, for ornamental lighting to create that gateway into the city of Oswego. 
at the six point intersection um, this concept it's very similar to what's out there today except for what we did is the major improvement is realigning the the crosswalks today the crosswalks are very very long um, and they're hard to navigate and so and they, they kind of go diagonally across the the intersection so what we show is making the crosswalks more perpendicular with the road so the crosswalks are now shorter um, it's taking uh, the two triangular areas um, you can see where the crosswalks meet those today they're they're there today but they're um, flat concrete um, we were thinking of making them into raised planter areas where we could have introduce some green to the to the intersection and also it creates a refuge place for if somebody's trying to cross the intersection and they get stuck between a light they have a place where they feel a little bit more comfortable they're not standing out in basically in the middle of the road this graphic shows the uh, the area around Oswego Health um, like I said we we heard from the public that the um, the bike lanes on Route 104 was they didn't think that was a good idea so by taking those off it, it provided an opportunity to address some other issues one of the issues that we heard was parking on Route 104 is a challenge um, especially when you enter the city from the from the from the west side um, you'll be driving along in the right hand lane and all of a sudden it turns into a parking lane there's a car parked there it's it can be confusing for people visiting it's confusing for people who live here um, so once we got rid of the bike lanes what that let us do is provide two dedicated parking lanes one on the north and one on the south side of the um, of the corridor um, one of the things that we also introduced um, in in this graphic here is uh, bump outs at the intersections which help to define the parking they allow for um, for there to be benches trees um, bike racks things like that site amenities um, and also what it does is it helps to shorten the crosswalk length so by shortening the crosswalk and also using materials for the crosswalk that are very visible um, it's bringing attention to the crosswalk and to the pedestrians and making it a safer environment uh, for people on 104 this graphic is uh, downtown between uh, West First and West Second Street um, which shows a similar similar treatment we have the dedicated parking lanes on both the north and the south with the bump outs on the corners of the intersection which create those shorter pedestrian crossings um, and here at the intersection of West First Street it shows the opportunity to be able to have additional planters uh, bike racks and uh, benches and trash receptacles uh, to create more of a pedestrian area um, on the corridor one of the other things we looked at was the the bridge over the Oswego River uh, many people uh, commented that this felt very uncomfortable to cross it was a it's a very wide bridge you have cars traveling very fast by you um, so some of the improvements that we suggested were uh, simpler improvements by including uh, narrow planters on the curb edge of the of the sidewalk to help create a separation um, between the cars and the pedestrians and also just the inclusion of some more amenities like banners um, hanging baskets things like that that help to um, add some life to the bridge and create more of a pleasant environment for people crossing this graphic shows um, again like I said the uh, we decided to take the bike lanes off of Route 104 so this shows a, a cross-section it's hard to see on the screen um, but it shows the two dedicated uh, parking lanes on the north and the south side um, of the road this graphic is the, it's the same graphic we looked at earlier um, we it's showing uh, the addition of um, on the north side of Route 104 in this area there is no sidewalk so that's showing opportunities to um, between East 10th Street and East 13th Street to have a pedestrian have a sidewalk on the north side that is accessible so that people from uh, people traveling to and from downtown in the retail area have a 
um, safe place to travel. And one of the other things that we looked at was the, uh, uh, the, in the retail area, um, another comment that we received from the public was that it felt, it was very wide, it felt very vacuous, um, it wasn't comfortable for pedestrians. So this was another opportunity to include some of those narrow planters uh, between the sidewalk and the road, um, the, addition of pedestrian, the addition of pedestrian lighting, street trees, um, to help create more of a, a welcoming environment for pedestrians. So since we took the, um, the bike lanes off of Route 104, um, we came back with another option that showed um, the implementation of bike facilities north of the corridor on Seneca Street and south of the corridor at Utica Street. Um, it would be a combination of dedicated bike lanes, sharrows, there's even opportunities to have uh, segments of bike boulevards where uh, you know, two-way cycle track uh, separated with a median, um, which could occur on portions of Seneca and Utica Street. And this graphic also shows the uh, north-south connections at key uh, roadways through the corridor to bring people from those bike facilities to downtown, to bring them to the retail area and also over to facilities at SUNY Oswego. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Kimberly for the implementation. So r wrapping up real quick, so Ted gets to show all the pretty pictures and then he makes me um, go over the cost estimates for the improvements. <laughs> so this, this slide got skewed a little bit, um, but you know, breaking up the corridor into the character areas and the major projects. All included, everything in is a total of a $31 million project, which obviously is a big piece of cake to, uh, to take out of, the, um, out of the pot. So part of the implementation strategy goes on, and you'd see this in detail in the final document, but breaks up each of those individual projects, not only into an overall phasing plan, but even within character areas or within sub-projects, they're phased. So you can start thinking about how do we integrate small pieces into our capital improvement program? How do we start biting off improvements that are going to make a difference as we're starting to look at different funding sources and grant resources out of there? So that phasing framework is included in the plan um, to help you start making incremental changes along the corridor that will make a notable difference. And some of that has already started happening. Last year, the city submitted a grant, as you probably all know, through the Climate Smart Communities for some bike improvements um, along Seneca Street, and that grant was awarded and will be implemented shortly. There are a number of funding sources that are readily available um, for the city to start looking at, including potentially you know, funding through the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. So that's it. Thank you again for um, your time, and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Uh, any counselors or members of the public have any questions for Kimberly? Is it okay? Great. Thank right. you. Thanks for Thank coming you. and uh, giving the report. Appreciate it. So, uh, also under the mayor's report, um, as most of you remember, I tasked the Community Development Office uh, last summer to uh, try to recoup some uh, money from the outstanding loan program that we run in the Community Development Office. And actually, uh, the way that that uh, loan is set up, the Community Development Office is supposed to uh, offer an annual report status of those loans, uh, status of the outstanding loans. So uh, I'm going to list some of the uh, loans that are currently delinquent. And uh, we've uh, attempted to contact the owners no payment arrangements have been made uh, by uh, these businesses and no payments have, have been received. And uh, going forward, it's our intention to report all businesses that are at least three months behind. Uh, and we'll also report any business that has made a refinancing uh, arrangement and then have missed the payment after they made the rearrangement. Um, so the businesses are Alice's Scoops, uh, 
Celtic Butterfly, Flowers by Mr. John, the historic Woodruff uh, Block Building, Mild to Wild, Mitchell Printing, St. Peter's Outfitters, and the building at 167 West 1st Street. Um, and this is so important because uh, actually the initial money uh, to create the commercial loan program that we have to offer stems back to the uh, late 1980s. It was a million dollars from uh, the HUD Small Cities program that we were given. Um, and every payment, it recycles the money. So every payment made is money essentially recycled back into the loan account so we can offer it to other startup businesses or businesses looking to uh, do a major project. Um, with a low interest rate is ultimately the benefit. About currently sits at about three percent, and uh, I'll use this opportunity to say that right now we have uh, approximately four hundred thousand uh, dollars not being used that we could essentially uh, give or loan. It's the more appropriate word uh, to small businesses. Uh, a small business that's opening can apply for uh, up to uh, fifty thousand uh, dollars to get a business going and open. And then uh, an existing business that has a major project they wish to do can apply uh, for up to uh, $100,000 through our community development office. So uh, yeah. this uh, list of business names was public. And going forward, I'll keep the council uh, updated on a monthly basis on who's paying, who's not paying, and uh, who has came in and made arrangements, rearrangements, and then not paid. Uh, because it's important, because it's, it's public money that that they knew was a loan and, and used the loan and forgot, then forgot about the loan part and you know, never thought enough to repay it. So uh, it's about time we recoup some of that money. Uh, and that's it under the mayor's report. Do any councilors have anything to add? Seeing none, will clerk please call resolution 206. Approved minutes, common council meeting held May 22nd, 2017. Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Walker. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. The clerk, please call resolution 207. Appoint Commissioner of Deeds. Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Van Buren. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remen. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Or please call resolution 208. Approve use of public space. Paul Stewart, owner of property located at 53 West Seneca Street, in order to install a fence. Councilor Van Buren. Councilor Reynolds. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Ramon. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 209. Approve use of public space Robert McGrath, proprietor of the Clubhouse Tavern in Spencer's Alley, located at 124 through 126 West 2nd Street, in order to host a breakfast fundraiser to benefit the Child Advocacy Center of Oswego County to be held Sunday, July 2nd, 2017. Councillor Emmons, Councillor McLaughlin. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Or please call resolution 210. Approve use of public space at Swigo Renaissance Association in order to place signs in recognition of neighborhood pride and block challenge grants. Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Van Buren. Any comments? Councillor Walker. Thank you. I just ask one question if they would not put it in view of drivers. Because last year I didn't know. Okay. Any other comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Or please call resolution 211. Grant permission to the Oswego YMCA to host the Dragon Boat Festival to be held August 25th through 26th, 2017. Councillor Van Buren, Councillor Gosick. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. 
Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 212. Accept donation of a park bench to be placed in Brightbeck Park in memory of Ron Conzone. Councilor Reynolds, Councilor Cordino. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 213. Accept donation of a park bench to be placed in Brightbeck Park in memory of Don M. Lyon. Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Gozik, any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gozik. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 214. Grant variance of the noise ordinance to Kristen DeSantis of the Sting of Oswego located at 49 West Bridge Street during the summer months. Councillor Emmons, Councillor McLaughlin, any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 215. Grant variance of the noise ordinance to Nicholas Serino, proprietor of Lighthouse Lanes located at 295 East Albany Street in order to host their Supper Summer Concert Series. Councillor Walker, Councillor McLaughlin. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 216. Refer wireless communications facilities application submitted by Verizon Wireless to the Planning Board for their advisory opinion. Charles Riley Elementary School. Councillor Van Buren, Councillor Walker. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 217. Refer petition submitted by Paul and Tina Sawyer, contract purchasers of property located at 10 Mark Fitzgibbons Drive, for a change of zone from an R2 residential district to a B2 central business district to the planning board for their advisory opinion. Councillor Cordino, Councillor Goza. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 218. Authorize public hearings regarding Verizon Wireless Telecommunications Facility at the McCroby Building, Walmart Store, and Charles E. Riley Elementary School. Councillor Van Buren. Councillor McLaughlin. Any comments? Please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Or please call resolution 219. Waive fees for the Oswego Yacht Club's National Hospice Regatta. Councillor Reynolds. Councillor Gosick. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. No. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 6-1. Will clerk please call resolution 220. Authorize mayor to execute all documents necessary for the transfer of property located at the corner of East First Street and Oneida Street. Councillor Walker, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Resolution 221 has been pulled. We'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Will clerk, please call resolution 222. Accept proposal submitted by the Broadwell Hospitality Group for management 
of the transient dockage along East Linear Park. Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Van Buren. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Or please call resolution 223. Authorize purchasing agent to seek bids for a new roof at the animal shelter. Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Van Buren. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Or please call resolution 224. Approve bond resolution. $3,600,000 to pay the cost of reconstruction of elements of the east and west side wastewater treatment plant. Councillor Cordino, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, this work about uh, uh, last week, uh, repairs to the east side wastewater plant, 180000 uh, sewer vac, 345000 uh, HVAC for the east side and west side wastewater facilities at 600000 dewatering equipment for the east side plant, 1.5 million, dechlorination system upgrade at the east side plant, 930,000, contingent soft costs about uh, 60,000. A lot of this work uh, we'll talk about later. We're exploring some grant opportunities for some of this work as well, so this uh, could go down. Any other comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 225. Approve bond resolution $2,300,000 to pay the cost of various capital improvements in the city of Oswego. Councillor Van Buren. Councillor Gozer. Um, when we took office, I think uh, most of us were surprised to learn that the city did not have. Uh, capital uh, budget plan or a cap capital expenditure schedule. Um, so within the first few months of uh, taking office, uh, I believe I asked uh, counselors and department heads to give us uh, some capital projects both in your ward and for uh, your department. So we compiled all of that information and uh, I proposed a uh, five-year capital plan which uh, had to go to the Common Council for uh, their approval, and we work together to uh, put some other projects in, take some out, prioritize them, and uh, hash out a schedule. Uh, on April 25th of 2016, uh, we adopted the capital uh, five-year capital plan uh, with a vote of 601 was absent. Uh, in that plan, um, we are essentially executing the, that plan with this uh, bonding, and we're really sticking to it as close as we can, primarily with years 2017 and 2018. Uh, and uh, the other items in here besides the 2017 and 2018 items are items that I proposed to be included in the um, 2017 budget, and council uh, took those items out to put them in this bond resolution, which kind of all agreed ended up making sense anyway. So uh, I'll read that list again. Uh, it's three plow sanders uh, at 225,000 each, which equals 675,000. A three yard payloader at 165,000. 16 acre garbage truck at 130,000. Street sweeper at 200,000. Six wheel dump truck at 95,000. Two three quarter ton pickups with plows, $40,000 each, that's 80,000. Uh, upgrade to the fuel tanks and dispensers at the DPW is 250000 uh, Rain uh, Rain garden beautification project at New York State 104 Center Median, 150000 The 2017 weed harvester is 67000 Animal control HVAC, animal control security, animal control outdoor runs, and animal control holding area, improvements to the holding area, uh, they're all 80000 Finally, finishing the Brittany Hills uh, development is 250000 with curb and infrastructure that uh, they were told they would receive when the development was developed and never received. 
Uh, improvements to the Ponzi Rec Center at $75,000 and contingent soft costs at $82,360. Uh, that puts us at $2.3 million. Uh, and where we came up with this figure is the city paid off the bonding for the marina that they bought several years ago. Uh, and, and that gave us room to uh, be able to bond. Plus, we have to do it to maintain our state aid anyway. Uh, the marina payment, uh, we feel that our goal was to keep the annual payment under what the marina payment was so it won't negatively affect our general operating uh, budget. The marina payment was $537,500 a year. All the items I just read clock us in at $460,000 a year. Uh, that doesn't have the interest calculated in quite yet, uh, so we'll have to calculate that in, but it will still be less than what we were paying per year uh, for the marina. So we won't exceed what that payment was and negatively affect the budget. And as I said last week, um, unfortunately, I think the eight of us can agree that we were left uh, municipal buildings and equipment that was outdated, run down, uh, old, not working like it should, unsafe, and um, I think we've all pledged at one time or another to, uh, we make a lot of decisions you know, together, and I think one thing we have in common is that we do not want to leave our successors the same problems we were handed when we walked in. And by responsibly investing back into the city in areas where we need it, uh, we'll prevent that from happening and not leave uh, the next city leaders and next generation with uh, building conditions and lack of equipment and lack of safe equipment uh, and leave the conditions that we were left. So I think this is the responsible thing to do uh, other than take equipment off the streets and let buildings continue to deteriorate and not invest in our facilities, which leads to consent orders and decrees. And uh, that's the exact route that, that I don't want to go down. So uh, do any counselors have any comments? Seeing none, we'll please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yeah. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 226. Approve transfer of funds from the personnel contingent account to code enforcement overtime account. Councillor Van Buren, Councillor McLaughlin. This uh, overtime stems from the uh, code enforcement sweep we did at the first and third ward during uh, move out season for the college. We had uh, the code enforcers come to work on Saturdays to prevent the stockpiling and debris build up we've seen in years past. So that's what this uh, overtime is for. Any comments from the counselors? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Please call resolution 227. Approve transfer of funds from the general fund contingent account to the Youth Bureau contracted services account and the Youth Bureau materials and supplies account. Councilor Walker, Councilor Van Buren. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 228. Approve attendance at the 62nd annual NICOM Fall Training School to be held September 10th through 15th, 2017, in Saratoga Springs, New York. Councilor McLaughlin. Councilor Van Buren. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Clerk, please call resolution 230. Approve attendance at the 62nd annual NICOM Fall Training School to be held September 10th through 15th, 2017 in Saratoga Springs, New York. Resolution 229, I apologize. Councilor McLaughlin. Councilor Cordy. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Please call resolution 230. Waive rules of the Common Council to present resolutions number 231 through 236 
from the floor without committee consideration. Councillor Van Buren, Councillor Emmons. Any comments? Or please call the roll. Councillor Gosek. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. No. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 6 1. Or please call resolution 231. Authorized purchasing agent to seek bids for the 2017 milling and paving project. Councillor Walker, Councillor Cordino. Uh, waiving the rules because a lot of these items are sending out to bid or grant applications, which are time sensitive. Uh, so this resolution will send out our uh, bid for our paving project in 2017. It's a 600, as it's priced out with the streets we have, it's a $658,793 uh, paving plan. Uh, it includes City Line Road from New York State 104 to East Albany Street, West 4th Street from West Seneca Street to Lake Street, uh, West 8th Street from New York State Route 104 to Lake Street, East 2nd Street from New York State 104 to East Cayuga Street, West Seneca Street from West Utica Street to West Mohawk Street, West Mohawk Street from Liberty Street to West 7th Street, West Mohawk Street from West 2nd Street to West 3rd Street. That'll be a shim. You'll see on that road there's brick exposed. However, uh, that area is due to be torn up in the consent decree uh, within the next three years, so it really doesn't make any sense to completely uh, grind down the road and put in new binder and everything else, so we'll shim it to get us to that point until it's torn up again. Um, Tallman Street from Hawley Street to Hart Street, Ellen Street from Liberty Street to West 7th Street, Hawley Street from Tallman Street to Ellen Street, uh, Syracuse Ave from East Albany Street to New York State Route 40, 481. And uh, Liberty Street from Ellen Street to the city line, that is where if you go down, uh, a lot of people don't, I didn't know that that's technically Ellen Street. If you're at the gardens, go that end, you have to take uh, When you go up past the apartments, up that big hill, that little section's technically Liberty Street, I guess. So we're doing from that turn all the way to the city line, which is where the water tower is, which is probably, I would say it's a very much between West 4th Street and uh, that street competing for the worst street in the city. So we get both of those done. Our chips allotment was approximately $820,000 this year. Um, this leaves a little bit of room for some sidewalk work we can use for that and for obviously any change orders. If we get to uh, the end of the plan, uh, end of the work, and we still have a gap, we can come back in, uh, in the form of a change order, add to so we're playing it a bit conservative here. Hopefully we have that problem. We can come back and add another street or so. I know uh, West Cuyuga Street down near the forks is pretty bad. It would be nice to get that one done. So um, that's the plan. Uh, to send out the bid. Any comments from the councilors? Uh, seeing none, will clerk please call the roll? Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yeah. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 232. Authorize Common Council to proceed with the completion of the State Environmental Quality Review Act process for the City of Oswego to act as lead agency for the Verizon Wireless Communications Facility located at the McCroby Building. Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Emmons. Any comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 233. Authorize Mayor to execute all documents necessary to apply for Act grant for the East Side Wastewater Treatment Plant Asset Management Improvement Project. So this resolution
position that they are funneling new information that weren't previously being told before. So we had to compile this information relatively quickly and uh, have to get it done this week. So uh, what this application will do, uh, this is applying for money from the um, Clean Water Drinking Fund. And essentially what we're doing is creating uh, an application that is for a $780,000 SCADA system, which is for the counselors that toured the plant. Uh, we've been made aware of that. It's been a problem for quite some time and it's just never been replaced or fixed. Uh, and also, if you remember last year, we did an asset management plan for the east side wastewater facility. Uh, and that asset management plan came back with a schedule for improvements and they uh, categorized those improvements in years one to two, one to three, one to five, two to five, two to seven. So this application will include that SCADA along with year, uh, years one through five on the asset management plan for work that needs to be done. Uh, and these two projects were also included in that bonding uh, resolution, so this really would help uh, with that resolution as well. Uh, the only issue is, because I guess it's a good issue, we won so much money Last year, we can only apply for 25% uh, 25, 25 of the funding, which is $1.4 million because of the money we won last year. So we're applying for essentially the max amount we can out of the clean water uh, grant applications. Uh, any comments from the counselors? <coughs> Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Oh, any call first and second? I have the first and second. Uh, Councillor Van Buren, Councillor McLaughlin. Please call them. Councillor Gosick. Yes. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Cordino. Yes. Councillor Reynolds. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Councillor Remmons. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 234. Authorize Mayor to execute all documents necessary to apply for and administer the New York State Water Infrastructure Improvement. Act grant for the Oswego Water Plant Improvement Project. So, Councillor uh, Van Buren, Councillor Walker. Uh, so this is the same pot of money, but this is the drinking water application. Um, this project is for our, our uh, water plant, which we're, as I said, we're finding out more information about that by the day, bringing in the new operators and. DPW commissioners out there doing some work and uh, providing us with some information. Uh, and what this application applies for is a backup generator that the county health department says we should have had for the last however many years. We haven't had. You need one. Power goes out. People still need water. Um, so we that uh, backup generator is for, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it's very expensive, like over a million. And um, also this is for one application with both the backup generator and the motor controls. So this application will be roughly, uh, well, the total cost for both things about 3.5 million. However, the most, again, we can apply for is 2.1 because of the money we won last time. So we're uh, essentially applying for the most we possibly can out of this uh, application as well. Any comments from the council? Seeing none, will clerk please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Clerk, please call resolution 235. Authorize Mayor to execute all documents necessary to apply for and administer the New York State Water Infrastructure Improvement Act grant for the Oswego Water Plant Infrastructure Project. Councilor Cordino, Councilor Emmons. This is the second application we're applying for from the same funding pool, uh, same application for the uh, drinking water fund. Um, so that resolution we just did is application number one with those two projects. This is application number two with uh, the projects that include upgrades to the pumping system and uh, HVAC system to the water plant. We estimate uh, these costs at about $1.1 million get funding for 60%, which is 660000 um, There's a total of uh, $3 million available. Like I said, 2.7 2. 
six last year, so we're maxing this out. Any comments from the council? See none, clerk, please call the vote. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Remmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7 0. Please call resolution 236. Express opposition to pending New York State legislation regarding zero emission credits for nuclear plants. Councilor McLaughlin, Councilor Emmons. There are currently uh, two bills being proposed, at least in the committees in the New York State Senate uh, and Assembly, that uh, are detrimental to the clean energy standards policy that's been put forward in an effort to save the uh, new plants here in Oswego County and all around New York. Um, and also a bill that essentially shifts the bill uh, from that to specifically Oswego and Wayne County, which isn't uh, in our best interest. So we prepared this resolution uh, that if you approve, I'll sign and we will mail to the chairs of the relevant committees, the leaders in the assembly and the Senate. And uh, I'll just read that so the public knows what's in it. Uh, whereas on August 1st, 2016, the New York State Public Service Commission adopted the Clean Energy Standard Governor Cuomo's historic public policy that recognizes the important value of protecting the environment, the economy, and the ener energy supply from New York State by valuing renewable energy and recognizing the need to pre preserve zero carbon nuclear plant power plants. And whereas Oswego County is the host county for three of upstate New York's four new power plants, and the city of Oswego is a direct beneficiary of a combined $3 billion in annual economic activity and over $145 million in annual state and local ta taxes generated by the owners of the nuclear facilities. And whereas the four nuclear plants in Oswego and Wayne counties account for a full 20% of the state's power supply, while annually avoiding 16 million tons of carbon emissions in the environment. And whereas a portion of the CES established zero emission credits, also known as ZEX, as a form of payment to the operators of the nuclear plant a formula that helps to cover the operational cost of these facilities established over the next two years uh, at seven, $17.53. Uh, and whereas these bills recently introduced into the New York State Assembly and Senate threaten the implementation of the CES and the ZEC payment formula by establishing an artificial cap of 25 cents per month for residential consumers of electricity and directing the payment for ZECs be borne primarily by the residents of Oswego and Wayne counties. And whereas the Common Council is fearful that the adoption of this legislation could result in the immediate closure of the nuclear plant power plants in our area and create a devastating economic, energy, and environmental crisis for our region and the state, now therefore be it resolved that the Common Council for the City of Oswego strongly opposes the consideration of Bill A-8246 and Senate Bill 6611 and Assembly Bill 8190 presently before the New York State Assembly and Senate due to the detrimental effect this legislation will have on the city of Oswego, its businesses, institutions, industries, and residents. And it is further resolved that Mayor William J. Barlow Jr. is hereby authorized to transmit a copy of this resolution to the leaders of the New York State Assembly and Senate, as well as others, to ensure that the position of the city of Oswego is clearly known. And it is further resolved that the sponsors of this legislation must realize that we are all New York, one New York, not upstate and downstate, and that together we must work together to preserve and strengthen the state's energy supply, the economy, and the environment we all share for the benefit of future generations of New Yorkers. Any comments from council? Seeing none, the clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Any other business to come before the council? Councilor Van Buren. Councilor Walker. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Gosick. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Resolution passes 7-0. Meeting is adjourned.